Okay, welcome to the second study group question and answer session. Um, I'm kind of lost in terms of who asked what question when, so I might be reviewing stuff that's already been talked about, but that's not to the bad because it's always worth uh, taking another look at these things. Now, let me clear some of the junk off. So, First up is this uh, this idea of, of pulling the wrist back, and uh, uh, Hanno points it out points out that I was doing that on an out breath, but that he feels that this coming the wrist coming into extension as the forearm comes back uh, gets evokes an in breath on him, and then we went and we had a whole discussion which I thought I would just share with you. I don't know whether we did this already or not. Where where the actual angle of the wrist is quite specifically and precisely aligned to the breath. So if I take an in-breath while my, my forearm is coming up and I extend the wrist, the collarbone rises and that encourages the upper ribs to open. And if I, and that's of course an in-breath, and so if I do the same movement but allow the wrist to flex I can do an in-breath, but it's not like I'm pulling the breath out of me. It's, it's actually more... This flexion of the wrist is more like an out-breath. And the flexion of the wrist does not give the same... Op Even if I go up like this, my collarbone does not open as much as, I, as it would if I extended my wrist. And then we get into this, idea, this quite precise thing where if you try it, like, raise the forearm and keep the wrist at exactly 180 degrees and notice the feeling in your collarbone and in your rib cage, And then modify that by 2 degrees. Let your wrist flex just so it's instead of 180 degrees, it's 178 degrees. Notice what's different through the, the whole... Or, or take the wrist into extension, but only 2 degrees into extension, so there's a 182 degree angle. And notice a change. 185 degrees, 175 degrees. You notice as soon as the wrist flexes instead of extending the actual direction, the trajectory of the forearm wants to change as well. So actually do those subtle changes in the wrist and feel how a small change in the trajectory in the angle of the wrist will affect the trajectory of the forearm and what's going on in terms of the collarbone. And the um, the, the ribcage, fascinating stuff. There's this whole huge world of interrelationship between the proximal and the distal, all governed by minute changes in the angle of that wrist. So, to me, you know, for me, I, like I've you know I I see people waving the wrists and it's got nothing to do with the musical content. So I say don't do that and everything. But now we have a whole new tool to, instead of just telling somebody, don't do that, we have a whole new way of, of not at all proscribing these wavy wrist movements, but just do them with awareness and do them with a sensitivity to how every change, subtle change in the degree to which you wave your wrist is having an effect on, on, the, on the sound and the musical shape. Then it becomes this fascinating uh, domain of, 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 of research and investigation. Yeah. So, now we have Grace. These are week one's questions, but I forget whether I answered them or not, so I'm just going to answer them again. Uh, the Mozart fantasy in D minor, the pedaling, uh, I said that measure one can be pedaled, and would fingering pedaling be acceptable here? Of course, yeah. Or else the finger pedaling. Oops, wrong. my foot's on the wrong pedal. So. Which is a fantastic effect. Holding finger pedaling the left hand and. Uh, That's uh, amazing because then, then you get this harmonic, and then a really combination of harmonic color and melodic shape. 
expressive shape. Fantastic. So that's one possibility. Another would be to, to, to finger pedal. Finger pedal everything. And then another would be... At that time I was with my pedal like this. So there are so many possibilities of, of pedal variations in this opening, all of which can go to, to darken or lighten or thicken or thin out the tonal color. I mean, this is why it's, it's a fantasy. I mean, this, these, these bars especially should be played in a fantastical way, which means you're completely free to create totally unexpected pedal or non-pedal effects. So, like, the you know, the f playing field is open, and you really it, you're at, at at liberty to do whatever you like. But I love that idea that you brought up. It's a, a wonderful, wonderful variant. In the adagio, the left hand half note uses handle finger pull, and the right hand melodic voice uses the gyrating Jarrett touch. Will these be the same movement? No. So I'm I'm doing a finger pull here. And that's standing me up so that I can now do a Tai Chi empty step. And this is, the gyrating Jarrett is, this would be a finger pull. Now did you notice uh, that it's a fairly open sound. The gyrating Jarrett, the hand is much more compact, so watch the difference. Uh, do you see the difference? My hand is like this instead of like this. Okay, so here my, my finger is standing, the finger is slightly curled, and the hand is pretty open. And then the gyrating jarret, the heel gets much closer to the fingertip. So it's compact, like it's, you, it's like you get the sound and you keep it more inside. Don't let the sound out of the hand. Don't let the sound out of that, keep it in the hand, and that gets it more concentrated. So, this is more concentrated. This is more uh, uh, pervasive. It, it expands into the atmosphere, and this laser beams into the atmosphere. Yeah. You see the difference? Of course, it, 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 it's all... Uh, there's all, uh, oh, I can't talk, I have to stop, I'm being distracted here. Yeah, so as I was saying, uh, I forget what I was saying. <laughs> in the left hand, I sense that the hand continues to grow through at the half note. Does the hand duplicate that growing note in the next half, in the next half note, or does the hand retain the high position since the note is the same? Good. So you grow grow, grow, and now I'm already up. Do I go back down again, or do I... So, it's, of course, it's stupid to go back down <laughs> once you're up. <laughs> so, you see, growing can be internalized. If I just... You, you don't see me growing, and my hand does not look like it's growing, but all the feelings, all the physical feelings of growing are there. But they're just, they're, it's, they're just hovering, growing, hovering, growing. I grow, grow, grow. And now I'm, I'm grown. Uh, sorry. No. Do not lean on this one. That is incorrect. This is correct. So the growing, there is a little breath. So you can grow again because you've got to take a breath to make sure that the that you're not using the chord tones as a trampoline to get you onto the next bass note. That would be incorrect. So therefore there is a certain growing. In measure 23, your suggestion of playing up bows in the right hand offbeats gives the passage a new energy. To match that sound, I tried to do more of the chuckling chicken touch, but I hope you, you could expand on that idea. Oh damn! I don't know. I don't have the music here. I don't know what measure twenty-three is. Up bows in the right hand. Yeah, I really don't know what measure twenty-three is. Sorry, we'll have to skip that one. Uh, <clears throat> on to the next question. 
Okay, so our next question is from Hanno Beckers. He's talking about what uh, Christian and I did in our lesson. Uh, so, uh, uh, and he, he, what I did with Christian in the lesson was to have him grow his arch in a way where there was no a minimum of effort, like the finger pulling the arm forward like that to grow the arch. No, just move the arm forward and the arch grows without there being any necessity to pull with the finger. And that, that's like very, very easy. And actually that uh, way of playing is closer to how we play than pulling up like this, which is more uh, a didactic kind of a thing. However, and so Hanno suspected that, you know, if, if you just move the arm and, and, and go like that and don't pull with the finger, that is just a position that somehow it's empty. I'm not really sure that this can be a short way to art structure, like a shortcut to creating art structure. Without activating the inner hand, which brings up the arch instantly, the, this, the, this wrist thing is only a posture, a position. It might be combined with grasping and the alligator jaws for the thumb. Uh, yes. So, you have to understand that in that lesson, I... Uh, I needed a first impression that would not create any sort of strain in Christian's technique in any way. He's a jazz pianist, he likes to just bounce around and play easily, and that sense of ease and spontaneity, I did not want to um, uh, impinge upon that in any way, hinder it, yeah? so. Uh, but you have to know that Christian and I had a private lesson later on. And actually, I was thinking of sending everybody that private lesson because in that lesson, we did get back to growing the hand by, w with some internal hand action, with some internal, internal hand grasping action. And we ended up sort of arriving at uh, a compromise, not a compromise, but a combination of that forearm movement and the finger movement. And somehow when you're playing, it turns out that there's, it's just like, you have both actions at your command, and there's a spontaneous co combination of them happening at any moment in time. And it's so spontaneous and so much apropos of what the music's demanding, and that is that you probably couldn't even tell with your mind. Oh yeah, this is 60% grasping and 40% uh, arm moving you into position. This is 95% arm moving into position and 5% grasping. Who's got, you know, who's, you know, it's a feeling. And it's a, a spontaneous, intuitive response to what's going on in the music. And so you have the, the entire spectrum from virtually all done with the arm to virtually all done with the finger. And different pianists, a different style of playing, like Rubinstein, of course, he, he loved that sense of the ah, that sense of the, the hand really like being very kind of effortful and raw. He liked the heavy action so that he could really feel the fingers working against that heavy action. Horvitz loved an extremely light action, the feeling that the skeleton's doing it all. Uh, but of course his fingers still worked, like the, the, the sense of them working, but working lightly and, and, and quickly. And not against that much resistance. So with the arm always, by its precise positioning, actually doing the lion's share of the work. Taking the strain off the finger. Uh, you know, so in all the different piano exercises, we're trying to uh, give the pianist a sensory experience of all these different modalities and so that when you go to play your neuromotor cortex just uh, spontaneously chooses the one that's going to work the best. Next question. Hmm, that's not a question at all. Let's see. Okay, that's not a question either. Can you explain the difference in the sound between the waltz bass and, and the mazurka bass? This is from Grace. This is for this week's, week two of the study group. Oh, damn. The, the, the question which I just a answered about Christian, that was in the pianos two group, not in the study group at all. Well, I hope it was interesting for you to hear about that anyway. <laughs> uh... Oh yeah, and Grace says that her seven-year-old student pointed out the hidden treble clef sign in, in the 
the tree of all the orangutan. And I must say, I never even noticed it until her seven-year-old pointed it out. So thank you for that. <laughs> That's great. My artist is better than we knew. Um, yeah. Can, uh, so the difference in sound between the waltz bass and the mazurka bass. Ha. That's... Uh, um, that's a hell of a question. You mean the waltz left hand and the mazurka left hand, of course. Uh, there is a difference. <laughs> but like, Yeah, uh, the waltz left hand is more elegant than the the mazurka left hand is most most folkloric. Mm -hmm. Both of them are based on lengthening the second beat and shortening the third beat. Body, to body, to body, to body, to. But uh, the the mazurka thing might have a, an extra rhythm put in. Ba da da ba ba da da ba. The mazurka thing might have an accent on the third beat, um, or a mazurka thing might have bum 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 accent on the second and the third beats only every fourth bar, um, and the waltz thing it has a similar lengthening of the second beat, shortening of the third beat, um, but it's doesn't have that, uh, it's a different feel, it's the, it's the waltzing feel, it's gliding. Da 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 bum 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 bee dee dee da da ya da 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 dee da 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 When the, the violins go to be ya da da dee 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 the orchestra continues. Da dee dee ba dee dee ba dee dee ba dee dee ba da da ba ba da da ba Okay. Did you hear? I just, I just discovered the difference by just uh, scatting them. Did you hear? The uh, waltz third beat has more lift, and the mazurka third beat is more of a, a settling down. Da 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 ba da 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 da. It's more of an ending on that th third beat. But the waltz is ba da da ba da da di da 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 ba da 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 da. There's always this poisonness on the third beat of a waltz, which is not the case so much in the mazurka. I could be wrong. This is all speculative, but that's the answer that just came up as we discussed it in real time with oneself. Thank you, Grace, for the for the question. It's so so interesting to actually think about these things and uh, actually discover something. Uh, okay. Uh, so now the rest of these questions I believe are for the uh, the other group, the Piano Spring 2021 group. So I'm going to stop there. Uh, but wait a minute. Here's something else on Grace. Uh, after the last, I resent my questions. Okay, yeah. Okay, so yeah. yeah, okay. I'm just, okay. I've covered everything that I need to cover now for the study groups because uh, Grace resent stuff, but there was nothing new in that. So now I'm going to go and. Uh, answer my questions for the Pianimals group. Thanks for listening. Thanks for being a part of this wonderful process.
flies through them, but Kathleen complains about stumbling through them. Well, a thing like that can be approached uh, either from a left brain perspective or from a right brain perspective. However, there's a way of combining left brain and right brain. For instance, if you simply tap together, left, right, left, together, left, right, left, together, left, right, left. Okay. You've already got three against two. So you did it mathematically, you did one, two, and three, one, two, and three. So that's a left brain thing. But of course, tapping, bum ba -gum, bum ba -gum, that's a very right brain thing. It's rhythmic and it's dancing and it's, it's something experiential. So, um, often when we try to do... Uh, uh, well, I, I get lost. Another way of getting a, a, around the two against three thing is to not think about two against three at all. For instance, if, if I go... I feel ah di ah di ah ah di di ah di di ah and I'm feeling just the pulses pulse something happens that glides you through to the next da. That's a very right brain way of doing it uh, and that's uh, to be done later. Uh, there are ridiculous ways uh, play two notes for every triplet note one and two and one. so it makes six notes at all in the triplet and then I just do th you see I just put three of these notes and then the next note the right of the other hand did you see so I actually felt exactly how the notes were together were together. Now I'm going to do three and three, and I'm going to put this one with the second and the fifth note. So in that case, it's very left brain because you're actually putting notes together. There's never a note that's in between two other notes. All the notes are played together. I mean, uh, the notes that are in between are regular in their rhythm in between, not in irregular in their in betweenness. Uh, okay, so that now we've already what is that three or four ways of practicing three against two? 
uh, but I think those are all the good ways. This one is really good. You should be able to do this on key. And if you, that, that sounds like three against two, but if you, you can't wrap your brain around it, then you just one, two, and three. 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 And then you really... It, it, it becomes automatically quite quickly, but you should practice this in the car. I played rock and roll, so of course we, we all, as a drummers, like I always wanted to be a drummer. So then you reverse it, so you're one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, and three, one, two, and three. No, I switched. I find that much harder. <laughs> so three against two is three in the right hand and two in the left should theoretically be harder, but anyway, when, when piano music's in, in, in question, it may not be. Uh, so it is and it isn't one of mathematics' great mysteries. More to the point is that we master this kind of thing by devising both left brain, which is kind of laborious, and that's what makes you stumble and halt your way through it, but maybe kind of necessary and then shifting over to a right brain mode experience of the same phenomenon and if you there are conscious things you can do to shift from left brain to right brain but you start with right left brain so this one is a left brain one and this is a left brain actually a little closer to right brain because this is a little closer to actually how you play it. This is Somehow I don't relate it in my experience to playing as much as I do this one. Yeah, and then you do these. On this sorry and then if you've done this and then the other right brain was in feeling the pulse and not caring what goes on between the pulse. If you've done enough left brain training, what will go on, what goes on between the pulse notes will work out mathematically, but not by you trying to make it work out mathematically. You've stuck it into your reflexes, you've put it into your your physical experience to the point where it can happen. It's actually happening at a brainstem level. Good. Thank you, Kathleen, for that uh, very, you know, you know, I should make a note of that. There should be some, there's, all of what I just said should be in Pianimals 3. P3 triplets, triplet practice. Good, thank you for that. Okay, next. Short question for this week from Elsa Pekur. What do you mean with the arm thumb? Is the arm in the mini body? Okay, sorry, you're new to the group. I've been throwing that term around for ages because Phil Cohen gave it to me. If it would see, if it's so, it would seem that the mini body is in fact that of an ape walking in a flexed posture using his hands to support his body weight. The arm in the mini body. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> Look, if the hand is a mini body, 
then the thumb has a, a, a foot, an ankle, a shin, a knee, a thigh, a hip joint, and a torso. There's no arm. The hand mini body with its ankle, knee, hip joint, pelvis, hip, pelvis, uh, spine, head, the elbow is the head, uh, that, that mini body has no arms. Okay? Well, when I'm saying an arm thumb, I'm not in the mini body, hand is a mini body metaphor anymore. I'm back in the real you and me, grown up people with a hand and a thumb which opposes itself to the arm and when it opposes, when, opposes itself to the fingers and when it opposes itself to the fingers now it looks like the fingers and the thumb are both moving and the arm is not moving so what if I just moved the fingers and kept the, the thumb directly a straight line you see the thumb in a straight line the thumb in a straight line I'm trying to get a good camera angle and a good lighting angle. The thumb in a straight line. The thumb in a straight. The thumb. Ah, oh, there's a good one. Look. The thumb in a straight line. Ah, finally, I got a good camera angle. So look, the fingers wrap around, but that thumb keeps its straight line, you see? Now if I do this, then if I if I if I oppose the thumb across, you notice I did not curl it. And if I pose the thumb across, if the arm follows it, it works better. So again, by following the thumb with the arm, I'm keeping the arm connected to the thumb. So what I mean when I say it's an arm thumb, I mean that the thumb and the arm is one thing. And the fingers are much more a separate thing. You see, this whole unit, the arm and the thumb, is one unit. And the fingers are something separate. Okay? So... That's an arm thumb, that's one unit. And the fingers are out here, wiggling around doing all sorts of stuff. Now look, the fingers can be connected to the arm, but you see the, 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 now the thumb is just hanging off to the side, but it, it doesn't look so, it doesn't have that amazing feeling of the arm thumb. The, finger, the fingers don't feel like a fin, fin, arm finger. It feels like arm hand finger. But the arm, the arm thumb feels like an arm thumb because the metacarpal bone, which would be in the hand, if it was a finger, is not in the hand for the thumb. It's di connected directly to the arm and it's moving. It's the, thir the thumb's third phalange. So, you see the thumb, look, the thumb is connected to the arm and the fingers are connected through the hand and the wrists of the arm. So, when I say it's an arm thumb, it's really, it's because it's directly connected to the arm. And when you avail yourself of the power of that direct connection, then you have a much better chance to play well with ease and potency and facility and power. Okay? Please let me know if that wasn't clear enough. Final question for this week's Pianimals 5. Um, in working, this is from Joyce, in working from the video from the last Saturday's lesson, there was a place where one hand was playing and the other hand arm was to support the playing and guide it. I've also seen you suggest this in lessons. Yeah, I suggest it all the time and I should expand upon that. I try to, when I bring the supporting hand across the support playing hand, I end up with a position where my thumb is up rather than my palm up. I find that in order to get my palm up, there has to be quite a weight shift on my sits bones as well as considerable amount of twisting in my torso. Now that's a fascinating perception. <laughs> uh, does this solution make sense or do you have other sessions? Well, uh, generally when, when I, I often do it this way. Uh, your name is Joyce Cameron and the left hand is playing. So I say, what's your name? Joyce. What's your name? Mrs. Cameron. Mrs. Cameron, teacher, this is Joyce, your student. Come on in and help your student. Yeah. But I come in with the palm under and the thumb over, you see. So the palm under is, wait, look. How much, look how difficult it is to offer a sense of support to the playing arm when only the little th the thumb is underneath. Now the thumb is half the hand. But in this case, getting the palm underneath, oh, my left arm just let go completely. So yes, the thumb is, it's actually, the thumb is not e even on top. The thumb is sort of beside. The thumb is actually on the radius bone. Okay. 
and the palm is underneath and the fingers are on the ulna bone. And so actually you can do tricky stuff like you can actually squeeze the radius and the ulna, squeeze the two bones and you, you, you actually start to feel, oh my god, you really feel the two bones in your forearm. That's a fascinating thing, but that's another thing. The basic thing is just to support the arm with the palm. And the more you support that forearm, the more the forearm lets go and becomes, as I said in my film, like a baby's bottom. And you can even do it with the thumb under. You see, I put my thumb under as well. I didn't put my thumb over. Thumb under is even better in a certain way. Yeah. Actually, this is a discovery for me now. I, I generally have not put the thumb with the fingers. Many Feldenkrais lessons put the thumb with the fingers when they're holding the leg or holding the foot instead of opposing the thumb. And now I see why. There's, when the thumb is with the fingers, when the thumb metacarpal is with the hand metacarpals, oh, there's even more sense of support. The gripping that like this gives us a different kind of support, but this is wonderful. So, then... so the sense of it's just to to really give yourself the experience of having your teacher come in and help you, and somehow that guiding hand it's sensing at the same time and guiding at the same time. It's both just sensing and guiding. So uh, often a lovely way to start with this using when you know I'm at the point where I'm recommending with re recommending with my students that if you're playing if you're practicing with one hand, if you're doing one hand practice, put the other hand on the forearm, just make it automatic, make it your daily practice, make it something that you just automatically do, because just sensing uh, it enlightens the, the 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 arm and the fingers and the hand. It it informs them and it illuminates what's going on and it makes so many things easier without even trying to influence and then if you add a certain guiding a subtle guiding influence to that simple sensing you've got a musical consciousness that's much more profound and enriched and present and proactive Things just start to flow and join to the musical contour in a way that's just more organic and more deeply rich than if you try to if the, if the one hand tries to do it on its own. So it can become addictive, this sense of the, of the hand supporting. But it is the palm under for sure, and either the thumb over or the thumb under as well with the fingers. So, so there are... This way, I do do it this way sometimes, but this is more like you're grabbing it. So there's actually more effort in the, in the supportive hand. See, my right arm has more effort now to grab. My right arm has virtually no effort now just to support. It's very easy. So the whole system becomes uh, lower effort, therefore greater sensitivity. Here's a little higher effort. Maybe sometimes, ah, come on. <laughs> you want to really get proactive in the way you direct. But I think the sensing and subtle direction is actually gives you uh, more likelihood of, of blending to the actual contour of the phrase. I hope I answered your question, but uh, I use your question as a springboard to just talk about this practice strategy, which for me is, is one of the, the essentials. And I should put that into... The animals for three uh, forearm support technique. <laughs> Great, I'm getting all these ideas. Okay, so that's it for this week. I'm looking forward to seeing you all on Saturday, and uh, keep those questions coming. <laughs>